Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome, and this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. In addition to my YouTube channel, you can also catch The Edric Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and a host of other online streaming platforms. Please hit that subscribe button, drop us a line, a review, um, subscribe to our channel, and let us know how we're doing as I continue to grow this thing from the ground up. Uh, over the summer, I've done a lot of a, a few shows around uh, short filmmaking, in particular film, the filmmaking process, film production. Um, and today's show, uh, it's in line with that theme, but we're going to talk about feature films. And my guest today is Ty Burr. Ty is a veteran film critic and was a pop culture columnist for the Boston Globe for many years. In addition, he was a senior writer and editor at Entertainment Weekly. He's the author of two books that were critically acclaimed. Gods Like Us on Movie Stardom and Fame, and The Best Old Movies for Families. In 2017, Ty was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism. Ty Burr currently writes Ty Burr's Watch List, a popular e-newsletter for movie and TV recommendations and cultural commentary. Ty, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Edric. It's very Pleasure impressive resume. You've, you've done you. a lot over the years, so thank you I've for coming on. I've been doing it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Um, let's start at the beginning. So when did you develop your passion for films, movies, uh, and particularly what motivated you to want to start writing about them? Um, well, I've been, I've been doing this for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm in my 60s now. And when I was a teenager, it was kind of a different landscape for both movies and criticism. Um, and I got into old movies as a teenager. I was, you know, kind of a teenage movie nerd. Um, I watched a, uh, there's a little bit of a story. My dad died when I was younger and my mom one night said that uh, a couple of years later, oh, there's a movie on late at night tonight. That was your dad's favorite movie. You should stay up and watch it. And it was a Marx Brothers movie called Duck Soup. I don't know. I love the Marx know. Brothers. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, um, and I had never seen anything like that. And that sort of opened the door for me to an interest in classic movies. Um, and then I got to college and started watching foreign films and learning about, you know, all sorts of other different kinds of films and became a film studies major. And around the same time, um, there was an extremely powerful and well-known film critic for the New Yorker named Pauline Kael. Um, it was actually sort of had a comeback. Uh, she, she's been dead for a couple of decades now, but uh, her, she's, her work has been sort of coming back lately and a younger, uh, you know, uh, film lovers are just rediscovering her. And she was, she was kind of, I, I always feel like she was kind of like the Elvis Presley of, of movie criticism. She just, just infused it with a lot of just verb and great writing and really opinionated, just kind of like the first modern film critic. And if you are reading her at an impressionable age and other writers that were coming up, you kind of wanted to do it. Um, so I just started, I was, you know, keep a journal. I'd write down what I was thinking about movies and music and reading a lot of other writing on movies and music and you just it's it's a fun thing to do so it's just something i you know wanted to do and ended up being lucky enough to do it and as i said in, in the opening you've had a very distinguished career uh but now you're doing tiber's watch list so tell me about that uh how did it get started and um what can people expect if they ch uh, check out your e-newsletter tiber's watch list well it's a pretty simple idea um and it came after i'd been about two decades at the Boston Globe, as early on, 19 years, almost 20 years. And the world of movies and the world of newspapers was very different when I left um, and I quit um, than when I started. For one thing, streaming happened. Um, and uh, especially with the pandemic, more people were watching movies and TV shows at home, you know, with, and then going to the movie theaters. And one of the issues is, um, especially I think for, you know, not not youngsters because not you know not twenty somethings because they're all looking at TikTok. Um, but for certain audiences, they have Netflix, they have Amazon Prime, they maybe have Hulu. They don't know what they've got, and they have no idea what's on there. So, Tiber's Watch List, which is the name of my Substack newsletter, Tiber's Watch List dot Substack dot com, is there to um, tell you what to you know where's tell you about good movies on all these different platforms and in theaters, and also talk about them. Did TV shows, uh, did a uh, um, a podcast with a well-known Boston chef where we talked about The Bear, the new, um, you know, TV series about a chef. Um, so it really is a way to sort of get people who love movies, help them to find good movies, um, including new ones that sort of came and went and snuck under the radar theatrically, but are out there uh, on streaming. Um, 
and really just help people find good things to watch because it's so confusing now with all the different platforms and all the different um, media coming at you from all sides. You really kind of, you know, the newsletter's there to help people cut through that. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead because I was going to ask you about streaming, but since you brought it up, let's talk about it now. Um, the streaming, as you mentioned, has had a huge impact on the movie experience, uh, yes. particularly around how people engage in movies, how they watch movies. Um, even you know, talk. We were going to we're going to talk a little bit about maybe some Oscars, how the Oscars and and, and award ceremonies are now affected yeah. because streaming movies are are, are um, eligible. So I was going to I was going to share with you. I was like I told you at the beginning, uh, right mm -hmm. before we came on. What happened to us and why I think this is such a relevant question. We were all set to go to the theater to watch uh, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Mm -hmm. And um, we were all set. We were going to go on the weekend. We were all set. Okay, we're going to go. About a day or two before, I get an email from Peacock. Hey, you can get Peacock Premium a whole year for 19 bucks, and you can see this film. Yep. So what did I do? I got Peacock. We sat down. We popped some popcorn, and we watched it in our home. Uh, as someone like you who have has a passion for the movie theater experience and just the the impact that that has when you see a great film, mm -hmm. and and by by the way, you also used to program for HBO and Cinemax. You used to program mm -hmm. films for the, for those organizations. I'm curious, what's your view on streaming in general, and um, has it even affected your movie watching experience? Oh, it absolutely has. It's affected uh, everybody's movie ex movie watching and TV watching experience. Um, and it has led, of course, to this area, it, new era of uh, golden age of TV, where we all have too many TV series that we're trying to binge. Um, and, you know, and, and that actually takes us away from, you know, good movies and, and actual, you know, real life. Um, but uh, it's a mixed bag because you have at your fingertips a lot of great entertainment. Um, including older stuff. And it's there, you can dial it up, you can search where to find it or what platform it's playing on. Um, at the same time, the home viewing experience just isn't the same. Uh, it's harder to concentrate on a movie when you're sitting at home, you got the phone, you know. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people watching a movie at home and they're really looking at their phone and looking at the TV every once in a while. And that's not watching a movie. Uh, and of course, seeing a movie with a crowd, I would think that, you know, seeing Hot for Jesus Save Your Soul with a crowd is going to be a much different experience because um, that's a movie that there's going to be a lot of um, response to, you know, uh, than seeing it at home. I just came from the Toronto Film Festival and I saw, you know, I, some of these big premier, movie, premier movies in big theaters with a packed house. Um, I saw the the new Billy Eichner movie, Bros, which is mm. a gay romantic comedy, like a sort of a Tom Hanks, um, Meg Ryan movie, but with two gay guys. Uh, and it's really funny. And just seeing that movie with a packed house, it's 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 a one on a kind of experience. It's It makes it, the movie even funnier and it makes the experience more fun than when you're sitting there watching it home. You're still going to laugh, but it's a different experience. It's, it's the same would be, you know, seeing Jaws in the theater as opposed to seeing it at home. Yeah, I, I, I know that I w did go back to the theater. Finally, the first movie I went back to see after the pandemic was Jurassic mm -hmm. World recently. Um, uh -huh. And again, I wanted to see that, of course, in the the, the big screen and the sound. And I uh, wasn't very impressed with the movie, I'll say. Mm -hmm. But the actual experience was great. Uh, and I know I'm going to go and see Avatar. I'll see the next Avatar. I'll go and see right. that one in the big theater. So the larger films, the big ones, you know, the action movies, those are great. But um, I, I do think you're right. I think the impact is is it's never going to go back to the way it used to be. And um, I, so touch, t talk to me now about, you talked about you were in Toronto and Oscar worthy. And, and so, yeah. so let's talk about some of those films um, that you saw and maybe uh, a couple of the African-American films that were premiered there that mm -hmm. you may have had a chance to take a look at. Yeah. Yeah. No, I saw, I was there for five days. I saw 23 movies in five days, which is what I do whenever I go to a, a film festival. You just, I just binge. Um, and then I come home and sleep for a couple of days. Uh, and, you know, Toronto, there's, there's four big festivals in the, in September that, announced the start of, you know, it's, it, of award season. It's when all the serious end of year movies come out. Venice, Telluride, Toronto, and New York, which is at the end of September, still coming up. Um, and so I saw some of the big movies that were being rolled out there. I saw The Fablemans, which is Steven Spielberg's new movie about his own growing up um, and you know, sort of a movie uh, obsessed kid um, dealing with his parents' uh, divorce. Uh, I saw Bros, which I mentioned. Uh, I saw the, you know, sometimes they use these festivals to launch a movie that's about to come out. Uh, the Woman King, 
being an example of that, which played, you know, the festival on the like the 10th and then opened in theaters on the, uh, you know, 13th or something like that. And uh, that I was really impressed by. That's the one with Viola Davis as a um, 17th century or no, no, excuse me, 19th century uh, warrior you know, queen in um, Dahomey, the, the ancient kingdom of Dahomey in Africa. Uh, and uh, it's it's kind of like a, a black female gladiator. Uh, and she's tremendous in it. And, you know, it's just a really good popcorn epic movie. And I hope a lot of people go see it because, um, of you know, all audiences, because it's just really, really well done. Um, and I'm, I'm not claiming it's great art, but it's a really, you know, like Gladiator. It's a, it's a picks you up and takes you to this place that you don't know, maybe know that much about, but maybe you should. And just gives you some really, really fine action and performances. So that was one that I was glad to see. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm seeing um, smaller movies, including some movies that haven't been uh, bought yet uh, by distributors. So they're being floated at these festivals or ones that are there. They bring there to sort of gauge interest and see um, how, uh, you know, audiences are going to respond to them before they, you know, um, market them. <laughs> I saw a movie called Chevalier with um, Kelvin Harrison Jr., um, which I was actually sort of disappointed in because it's it's it has a great subject. There was this 18th century Creole violinist, composer, conductor in Paris, a guy named Joseph Boulogne, uh, who's, who's a friend of Marie Antoinette's. She, you know, gave him a title of chevalier. He room, he would, roomed with Mozart. Um, he had this incredible career. He led the Paris, uh, you know, classical uh, symphony. Um, and uh, the movie is written by the woman. Um, by uh, Stephanie Robinson, who wrote um, um, uh, "What What We Do in the Shadows" for TV, she um, and uh, directed by Stephen Williams, who uh, directed Watchmen. And it's a lot of great talent there. And I was actually sort of disappointed in the movie. It looks great, um, but it's kind of got a really sort of shallow MTV kind of script. Um, but looks great. Uh, you know, if that's one you want to see, you want to see it in a the theater because the costumes are incredible and, um, you know, everything's very big. Just not a lot going on in there. But that's a movie where they, the studio has it. They want to put it out in front of a festival audience and see how audiences and critics respond. Um, I guess when you're in that situation and you're watching these great films and, you know, you're, people are generating buzz about Oscar candidates and this and that, um, Hollywood kind of has a reliance on, you know, film critics to um, get the word out, to talk about it, to generate buzz about it. Um, but I would imagine Hollywood also has kind of a love-hate relationship with critics because, well, they do. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little about that. What's your experience been like? Uh, maybe you had to review a film, you know, negatively and maybe you ran into some of those folks or just that whole, ex that whole experience of being a film critic as it relates to Hollywood and big films and their need for criticism at times. Right. right. And, and, you know, it, it makes sense to sort of distinguish between um, criticism as, you know, honest film, crit, crit, honest critical writing um, and critical thinking. And there is a tendency for the studios and the, and the publicists to want us to be an extension of their publicity mm. um, campaign. Um, and I have had, the head of an independent studio, when I gave one of his films three and a half stars, he literally emailed me and said, couldn't you squeeze another half star out of your pen? Because all they care about is having four stars on the poster. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not here for the studios. I'm here for the readers and readers who, you know, presumably care about movies and care about what, you know, they're going to see tonight, you know. Um, yeah, but want to know what a movie's about, know if it's any good, and maybe... Um, think a bit about, you know, um, its place in the culture, what it's trying to say, um, the performances, things like that. There's a lot to talk about with any film. Every film is different. Um, and the studios, um, I would say they do more than tolerate us. They kind of need us to get the word out. Although in the internet era, in the world, we're, the world of Rotten Tomatoes and YouTube critics, um, that's changed. And there is a sort of level of movie critic that is out there just to kind of get hits and talk about the content of a movie and not really think about it critically or write about it critically. And by critically, I don't mean negatively. Sure. I mean, just look at it, um, you know, both 
come to it as and you know figure out what the movie is trying to do whether it's an entertainment or something that's trying to be more serious and appreciate whether it's doing it well or not you know um i definitely try and figure out whenever i watch a movie you know in the first five ten minutes okay what kind of movie what is this movie what does this movie want to be um and gauge it on those terms and um see if it is the best movie that it wants to be um <laughs> Because everybody wants to make a good movie, and um, but most movies are average. That's what average means. So. I, I know that at times there's a, a divergence between um, film critics' reviews and sometimes you know the uh-huh. people, so to speak. Yes. And uh, have you ever had a situation where there was a movie either you liked and the public didn't like, or or the oh. public loved it and you didn't like it? I mean, plenty uh, of times. Yeah, t- t- tell plenty, us about that. Plenty of times. I mean. Not all the time. That's not, you know, and I don't take any particular pride in it. That's not, um, and there is this sort of public view of, you know, film critics and critics in general. It's it's the uh, Ratatouille view of, you know, uh, Antonic Ego in that movie as this sort of elitist, um, pretentious, you know, ascot wearing, uh, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't know how to enjoy, which is ridiculous. I'm in this business because I love movies. I'm in this business because I watched a Marx Brothers movie when I was 14 that made me fall in love with this medium. Um, I love this medium as much as anybody else does. When you're a professional critic, you, when you're a professional critic of anything, when you are into any subject deeply, you become a connoisseur. You just do. You become, and that's not a bad word. It's just you pick up you have a greater breadth of knowledge, you know, you've um, seen more, you've maybe read more, you've kind of gone into the background of history just because you're curious. And um, you maybe uh, appreciate um, aspects of the craft that the average moviegoer doesn't. Uh, so, you're, you know, you're kind of paying attention to the camera work and the score mm-hmm. and the costumes and the performances. And it's all kind of percolating there in the back of your mind. Um, and you also... If you do this enough and you do this for a living, you get tired of lazy thinking and entertainment. Mm. And you get, um, and that some, sometimes audiences want to go see something that does not, um, that they kind of already know how it is going to turn out because it's kind of comfort food. And generally critics want to be, get tired of seeing the same old stuff because they see it all the time. So something that comes along that feels a little fresh, they'll respond to. Um, and I will also say that in the last 20 years, with the rise of um, franchise, with the sort of dominance of franchise comic book movie making, um, it is, and those movies are not, I'm not going to say they're critic proof. Um, and I like a good superhero movie when it's done well, and like Taika Waititi directs it or something, or I mean, somebody yeah, brings yeah. something fresh to it. Right. Um, but the ones that are basically product, um, I, you know, I've lost interest in and um, and the audiences that go to those probably have no interest in reading what I'm going to write about them anyway. Um, so yeah, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But um, I do feel like those kinds of movies um, are not. I'm not interested in in what they're really doing because they are not interested in doing anything really more than um making money and sort of feeding audiences exactly what they want you know and i think about the one star wars movie that took some chances which was the uh, the return of the jedi uh the ryan johnson one which i thought was the best of the bunch of the, of the most recent one and the fans just hated it because you know they because they thought it was too woke and you know, there all sorts of problems so you know and with certain um, intellectual property franchise uh, movies. I actually see the the audience, the core audience fan bases on as a um, as a cause for sort of conservatism for not doing anything different. And uh, you know, m- movies don't have to be art, but they have to be fresh entertainment and well crafted and freshly thought entertainment. Well said. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and um, sure. I know we want to talk a little bit about. Um, analog movies and i mean dvds mm-hmm. uh, like millions of people i have a stacks and stacks and stacks of dvds uh some of those movies you can't get you know online they aren't streaming um do you think that there'll ever be an opportunity for a resurgence of dvds kind of like we've seen a vinyl resurgence in, in music over the past uh, five to ten years uh what's your take on on dvds i would like to th- think so um 
I think there was a sort of a recent alarm bell rung when um, it became known that um, uh, Discovery, which is buying uh, Warner Media, so it's going to be taking over H- uh, HBO Max. Wow. HBO Max is on. You know, if you follow the chains of who owns who, it's 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 very interesting. Um, and HBO Max has actually been one of the better streaming platforms. And all of a sudden, they're junking a bunch of they're, they're pulling a whole bunch of movies and TV shows and. They're remaking it into something that we don't know quite what it is going to be yet, but it's not going to be, I think, as um, uh, great for fans of movies um, and older TV as it was before. And the argument, you know, as this has been becoming known to, um, to you know, just not just critics, but casual fans who are sort of paying attention to the industry, uh, you're hearing this like, you know, physical media is where it's at. If you really want, really love something, get it on disc, mm-hmm. get it on, you know. Um, get it in a format that you can own, because the thing about streaming, not just movies, but music is, you know, remember when we used to buy stuff yeah. and keep it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I could turn this camera around and you can see all my old vinyl and my you know, stacks of CDs um, and, you know, all this physical medium. And it's got some cassette tapes, um, physical, me- and physical media that you bought and you kept and you can uh, access anytime you want. Um, you know, you can see my, I've got all these Criterion DVDs up there. Um, when those are on streaming, they can go away at any time. You do not, you rent them. You rent the experience of being able to access some of them at any given time. And the corporations, entertainment corporations, hold on to, you know, the actual content and can do whatever they want with it. And if you especially are interested in what they call legacy content, which means anything older than five years, um, you better get it on disc. Mm. You better get it on, uh, you know, some format that allows you, if you want to see it, because uh, it could go away. So I would love to see a resurgence in DVD. Um, I think, who knows where the streaming landscape is going to play out, because there's still a lot of competition with all the major players, um, and there's going to be mergers, and there's going to be, you know, it may go back to having, you know, the days when we had three broadcast channels that we had to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, but right now it's totally confusing. Do you get Hulu? Do you get, you know, uh, HBO Max? Do you get, you know, it's a dizzying number of streaming platforms. Um, Peacock, Paramount Plus, everybody wants to get their, you know, get their um, content out there in a way that uh, they don't lose this battle. Um, and I don't know how it's going to shake out, but uh, they are not the consumer's friend. At the end of the day, they're not your friend as a movie lover or TV lover. So um, it behooves you to, you know, buy the stuff on physical media if you can. So yard sales, garage sales. Yeah. <laughs> um, eBay. Stores. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because, um, you know, like you're right, they they don't make them like they used to anymore. You go to Best Buy and there's literally no DVDs, no CDs right. anymore. So, yeah, I think that there is going to be. And one thing that's kind of uh, weird to see is that so Netflix and Amazon are sort of becoming studios in their own right they're making movies um and in some cases they're not releasing them on physical media at all hmm. so you're out of luck if you uh want to say I don't, I don't know you know like blonde the new F, uh, netflix movie about marilyn monroe um that's coming out uh tomorrow i believe um i don't know if that's going to be on dvd hmm. which to me to, to me then you know, we're back in the days of old Hollywood before TV where a movie would come out and then they'd destroy the prints because there was no second, there was no aftermarket, mm-hmm. you know, um, which is why we don't have a lot of sort of, uh, the, you know, I think 80% of cl- old movies are gone. We'll never see them. Unbelievable. Well, yeah. Ty, again, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to thank chat you, with me today. I'd love to have you back on, uh, especially as we maybe get closer to Oscar uh, season and things like that. And um like you, I'm, I love movies. Uh, I can't wait for the next Black Panther to come out. I mean, there's so yeah. many giant movies that are coming. Avatar, which I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, um, again, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know um, you're getting into your season now. With, uh, yes, I am. In fall. So, uh, again, so if people want to get a hold of you or uh, get a chance to take a look at your um, online presence, where can they go? So the uh, newsletter is called Tiber's Watch List. It's at Tiber's Watch List, one word, dot substack.com. 
Um, it is free. If you want to pay, you get extra content and you get the ability to comment. So, um, so I've got a lot of free subscribers and I've got a, a lot of people who are paying who, and so good, healthy conversation going on there. It's a lot of fun. Um, I'm really enjoying it. And the people who are subscribing seem to enjoy it as well. Um, but thanks for having me on and I would love to come on again. Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. And for our YouTube viewers, uh, we would definitely put a link to uh, Ty's newsletter uh, in the description. You can click it there. So again, Ty Burr from Ty Burr's Watchlist. Thanks again. This is The Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome. We do want to thank you for tuning in. Don't forget, this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Catch us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any of your favorite online streaming podcast platforms. Drop us a line, subscribe. Uh, leave a review, a comment, let us know how we're doing again as we grow this thing from the ground up. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you on the next episode.